Welcome, friends, on this first day of spring, 2021. My name is Carl Bellinas, and I am the president of the Friends of Maple Grove. We have weathered the pandemic of 2020. We have also come through a number of heavy snowstorms this past winter. But the first hints of spring can be found right here at Maple Grove. I'm sure we are all looking forward to the glorious return of nature in bloom, where we can all come up for air. It's time to come up for air. Oh. Today, we are honored to present to you a unique presentation, a historical lecture and musical concert. The motto of the Friends of Maple Grove is where history comes alive. And that motto surely does come alive today. This lecture will be given by Katie Carmichael, who is from Scotland. Katie traveled to New York City to learn about the fate of her great-grandfather, Thomas McCain Carmichael, who died under mysterious circumstances in 1939. She found a paper trail that led her to Maple Grove Cemetery, where Thomas was laid to rest in an unmarked grave so many years ago. Being a talented artist and designer, Katie embarked on creating a wonderful book about her great-grandfather and her journey of discovery. The title of her book, My Great-Grandfather, The Alien, A Scrapbook Account of an Ancestral Journey. Through sacrifice and determination, Katie wanted to place a proper memorial on her great-grandfather's grave. And today, we unveil this beautiful and fitting monument to Thomas McCain Carmichael. This monument made of granite with a solid bronze plaque, has been placed on the grave of Thomas Carmichael, who was buried at Maple Grove Cemetery in 1939. On the plaque is a photograph of Thomas taken on his wedding day. The second part of our presentation is a musical one. Since Thomas lived most of his life on the sea, Celeste Chow and her group of talented singers and musicians will perform a number of delightful sea shanties for your listening pleasure. Thank you, my friends, for your support and encouragement. We have a very active Facebook site and website. We are now in the middle of our annual membership drive. Please remember to renew your membership. And if you are a new listener, please consider becoming a member. Visit our website for further information on how to join. We are certainly fought the good fight and weathered the storm. Please enjoy our special presentation. We can all now come up for air. Hi, to all the friends of Maple Grove in New York from Scotland. On behalf of the Carmichael family, I'd just like to thank you for taking such good care of our ancestors, Thomas and Elizabeth, and to thank you for honouring Thomas in this really special way. We're looking forward to the show, and hopefully in some time in the future we'll get to come across in person. But in the meantime, we wish you the best of health, or as we say in Scotland, Slangevah. <laughs> Was Thomas Carmichael. The family legend at home in Scotland was that Thomas had been brutally murdered on New York's docks in 1939, and mystery and intrigue have been part and parcel of the Thomas Carmichael story ever since. 
Thomas was born and grew up in the overcrowded, sickly and notoriously violent south side of Glasgow, a city built on a grid system. On December the 1st, 1888. On the other side of the Atlantic, the bustling, burgeoning and buoyant New York, where Thomas's ship steward father had voyaged on a couple of occasions, was similar to Glasgow in many ways. And yet it offered something completely different, a land of opportunity. Thomas's early career coincided with the start of the First World War. Working for David McBrain's then small puffer boat company, Thomas was chief steward on small cargo vessels, including the Dirk, which was exploded by a German U-boat torpedo while on service in 1918. Fortunately for Thomas, he wasn't on board. Thomas joined the Naval Reserves, serving at HMS Tarlier, a naval base carrying out the highly secret Hawk Creek hydrophone sound experiments to detect German U-boats. I wondered, would Thomas have been privy to official secrets at Hawk Creek? In the time between the start and end of World War I, Thomas married a young crofter girl called Mary Campbell from the idyllic village of Tinault in Argyll. They had two children at her family's croft, and Mary worked as a servant while Thomas was at sea. Thomas's work as a steamship steward kept him at sea far more than he was ever on land. The infamous United Fruit Company was his main employer, and he's listed as an alien on dozens of the Great White Fleet's documents processed at Ellis Island under the gaze of Lady Liberty. During this time, the United Fruit Company's Ulua, Cizola, Veragua, Musa and Carrillo steamship journeys exposed Thomas to exotic lands, including Cuba, Jamaica and Honduras, a stark contrast to the smoky, bleak city of his youth. By 1919, Thomas had set his sights across the Atlantic. Like his father before him, he worked on ships that made voyages to New York. Imagine his descendants' surprise to find out that Thomas didn't just work there though. He made the big decision to make the Big Apple his home and applied for US citizenship a few years later. And what about Mary and their two children, Duncan and Elizabeth? Well, they stayed in Scotland, estranged from Thomas. He sometimes visited and sent gifts, but otherwise stayed overseas, giving him his enduring reputation as the black sheep of the family. When he was docked, Greenwich Village was Thomas's home. Owned then by Annie McCurdy, a Glasgow girl, 109 Bank Street was a simple boarding house for seafarers on the nearby Hudson River. While Thomas was based in Bank Street, Peter McCann from Scotland came to live there. This man of just five foot one inch, with blue eyes, brown hair, and a gunshot wound to his left foot, was a former intelligence scout of the Canadian Expeditionary Forces Cyclist Platoon. He declared his intention to move into the same address as Thomas, to become a US citizen, and to change his name to Peter Carmichael. Who was this mysterious new arrival? And why was he calling himself Mr. Carmichael? Thomas's final voyage was from the port of Cristobal to New York on the Grace Line Santa Barbara, which docked on January 30th, 1939. Four days later, on February 3rd, Thomas was admitted to the city's iconic Bellevue Hospital with fractures to the front and back of his skull acquired on West 14th Street. He died from his injuries that day. Bellevue has a three-century reputation for turning no one away, a place where the poor, the immigrants and the downtrodden of New York are treated equally alongside wealthy and high-status patients. After he died, Thomas was examined by Milton Helpern, MD, who later became a world-famous medical detective known for his ability to solve suspicious deaths. For Thomas, his official verdict was accidental death, noting that he was said to have fallen in the street. At the end of his career, Dr. Helpern wrote in his memoirs of experiences as New York's chief medical examiner about skull injuries to both sides of the head. He said, 
one that has caused a lot of argument among pathologists and neurosurgeons for many years. Instead of the brain damage being confined to the area of injury, there is usually damage opposite on the other side of the brain. For instance, a typical case is of a drunk who teeters over backwards after coming out of a saloon and falls full length onto the sidewalk. He cracks the back point of his head on the concrete and gets massive pulping of the frontal lobes of his brain to such an extent that the thin bone forming the roof of his eye sockets gets fractured by transmission of the force of the impact into the undersurface of the frontal lobes of the brain. Other experts have said that this type of injury can come from the force of a fall, blunt force trauma or a punch. I wondered, did Thomas fall? Was he pushed? Struck? What happened in the days between docking at Pier 57 and his fatal head injury at West 14th Street? Sadly, we may never know. Thomas is as elusive in death as he was in life. New York archives tell us that he was buried in two places. Church records say he was laid to rest at Bellevue Mount Hope, though his death certificate says he was taken to Maple Grove in Kew Gardens, Queens. We now know that he is in fact at Maple Grove. Maple Grove is a tranquil resting place for people from across the social spectrum, from those of all faiths and none. Slaves, immigrants, social reformers and pioneering artists and performers share this peaceful corner of New York as equals. Even from an early age, Thomas had lived in ambiguous circumstances. While he had been known as Thomas Carmichael since childhood, his parents and siblings interchanged between this surname and McCann, the family's real name. For reasons on which we can only speculate, the family changed their name from McCann on the 1891 census, adopting Thomas's paternal grandmother's name, Carmichael, instead. Perhaps his parents worried that McCann sounded too Irish amidst the culture of anti-Irish immigration feeling in Glasgow at the time. Or perhaps they were evading some other issue. Maybe they just had so much fondness for their grandmother that they wanted to keep her name going in the family. We may never know. Regardless, Thomas passed on the Carmichael name to his children and it has continued in our family ever since. And so... On emigrating to the States, Thomas's younger brother, Peter McCann, opted to formally change his name to Carmichael, and the plot he purchased in Border at Maple Grove Cemetery allowed for the burial of his brother and their sister, Elizabeth, who had emigrated to New York with her husband, Robert Brown. They emigrated to New York in the summer of 1951. Elizabeth died one month later. Peter's career was as colourful as his older brother's. He served in both world wars for the US Army and Canadian Expeditionary Forces, worked as a chauffeur and machinist in Tuxedo Park for the legendary Ambrose Monel, an impoverished engineer who invented the revolutionary Monel metal, and latterly became a housekeeper at the prestigious Oliver Cromwell Apartment Hotel rented by Manhattan's wealthy elite. Peter died an old man, in 1978 in Flushing in Queens. We still don't know where he is buried. For generations, Thomas Carmichael's name has carried an air of mystery for his descendants in Scotland. Thanks to New York's public records and Scotland's national archives, 100 years on, we have been able to construct a timeline of his life and death in Manhattan and his time at sea, with only a few mysterious blanks still to fill. We like to let our imaginations do that work, sometimes leading us to conclusions that Thomas was involved in international espionage, or that he was possibly just a free spirit. While he'll always have the reputation as the black sheep of the Carmichael family, Thomas leaves us a curious legacy of mystery and intrigue. Lament on the death of his second wife. It's very beautiful with a 
uh, tambora, the Indian instrument, as a background sound, which would be similar to the rag, the bupali in Indian music, which is the pentatonic scale notes are used, which are So here is a lament. Sing me a song of a lad that is gone. Say, could that lad be I? Mary and Saul, he sailed on a day over the sea to sky. Give, Give me, me again, again all that, that was there. there. Give, Give me, me the sun that shone. soul give me the lad that's gone sing me a song of a lad that is gone say could that lad be behind mary of soul he sailed on a day over the sea to sky to Mountains of rain.
song of a Lord that is God over the sea to sky. Tale or two, 
about the flapping fish and the girls I've loved. On nights like this with the moon above, a whale of a tail and it's all true. I swear by my tattoo. Now, there was Harpoon Hannah, met her off the coast of Java. When we kissed, I bubbled up like molten lava. Then she gave me the scare of my young life. Oh, blow me down and pick me up. She was the captain's wife. Got a whale of a tail to tell you, lads. A whale of a tail or two. About the flapping fish and the girls I've loved. On nights like this with the moon above. A whale of a tail and it's all true. I swear by my tattoo. Now, there was Typhoon Tessie. Had a face that spelled out danger. My heart quivered when she whispered, I'm there, stranger. Bought her trinkets that sailors can't afford. And when I'd spent my last red cent pea, she tossed me overboard. Got a whale of a tail to tell you lads, a whale of a tail or two. About the flapping fish and the girls I've loved, on nights like this with the moon above. A whale of a tail, and it's all true, I swear by my tattoo, I, I swear by my tattoo. Thank you. 
dreams that couldn't get any higher They've withered now they've gone But I said you think and my way is clear And I know what I will do tomorrow The hands are shaken and the kisses float Well I will disappear Come let me tell you that I love you Think about you all the time. Caledonia, you're calling me. Now I'm going home. If I should become a stranger, know that it would make me more than sad. Caledonia's been everything I've ever had. By yon bonny banks and by yon bonny braes, where the sun shines bright, a la and where me and me true love wherever want a gay, by the bonny bonny banks a la Scotland of holy, but me and my true love will never meet again on the bonny, bonny banks of Loch Lomond. Twas there that we parted in yon shingle on the steep, steep side. spring again and the world knows not how we are Oh, my God.
From all the young fellows that follow the sea. So we can wait and blow the man down. And pray, pay attention and listen to me. Give me some time to blow the man down. I'm a deep water sailor just in from Hong Kong. So we can wait and blow the man down. If you give me some rum, I'll sing you a song. You give me some time to blow the man down. Twas on a black baller I first spent my time. Took him away, hey, blow the man down. And on that black baller I wasted my prime. Give me some time to blow the man down. Tis when a black baller's preparing for sea. Took him away, hey, blow the man down. You'd split your sides laughing at the sights that you see. Give me some time to blow the man down. It's tinkers and tailors and soldiers and all. To the great and blow the man down. That ship for prime seamen aboard the black ball. Give you me some time to blow the man down. I win a black baller is clear of the land. To the great and blow the man down. Our bosun then gives us a word of command. Give, Give me some, some time to blow the man down. Lay aft is a cry to the break of the poop. Send me away, hey, blow the man down. Or I'll help you along with the toe of my boot. Give me some time to blow the man down. Tis larboard and starboard on the deck you will sprawl. Send me away, hey, blow the man down. For kicking Jack Williams commands the black ball. Give, Give me some, some time to blow the man down. I first is a fist, and then it's a paw. Took him away, hey, blow the man down. When you ship as a sailor aboard the black ball. Give me some, some time to blow the man down. Blow the man down, blow the man down. Give me some time to blow the man down. Blow the man down, blow the man down. Give me some time.